Hello and welcome to the first part of a course designed to help you work with NetCDF files in Python. I'm Luke, I work as a data manager at the Norwegian Meteorological Institute. I also hold a 20% position at the University Center up on Svalbard. I spend a lot of my time working with NetCDF files, as well as teaching people how to publish their data. In this course, you're going to learn how to read and understand NetCDF files, get data out of a NetCDF file, and also create your own NetCDF files. The course should be suitable for beginners who know nothing about NetCDF files and are perhaps uh, relatively new to Python, although we'll be assuming that you've got Python installed. There might also be some of you watching who are more experienced and who have been working with NetCDF files for a while, but I hope you'll also be able to gain a lot from this course. I'll be going through all of the best practices and explaining why they are best practices. You might be here because you're interested in publishing FAIR data, but did you know that a NetCDF file is not necessarily FAIR unless it adheres to certain conventions? So throughout this course, you'll learn all about the climate and forecast conventions, or the CF conventions, as well as the attribute convention for data discovery, or the ACDD conventions. And you'll learn how to make sure that your NetCDF files are compliant with them. In the description below the video, you'll find the current contents of the course with the links to each video. But if you think anything is missing, please let me know in the comments and I will consider extending the course and making uh, more videos. I've also made a Jupyter book to accompany this course. It contains all the code that you're going to see on the screen, accompanied by descriptions and explanations. So go and check that out. There's a link down in the description to the part that accompanies this first tutorial. You can of course copy and paste some of the code from there if that's easiest for you. So let's get started with this first part where we'll be opening up a NetCDF file in Python, learning about how the file is structured and what the different components are. And I'll show you the basics of how to get data and also metadata out of the file. So I'm gonna work in VS Code that you can see here, but you're free to work in Spider or Jupyter Notebook or whatever you're most comfortable with. The first thing to do is import some of the modules that we're gonna to use today. The first one is X-Array, and if you've not got it installed already, you can do that with pip install X-Array in your terminal. This is not in Python. So VS Code is nice because it's possible to access a terminal within the same window, but you can of course just go to your terminal uh, externally and do the same thing. And we're also going to need to do pip install netcdf4, which X-Array is dependent on. Now you can use netcdf4 as a different module to interact with netcdf files in Python. Netcdf4 is very powerful and you can do a lot with it. But I think the syntax in X-Array is a bit nicer and easier to work with. So throughout this course, we're going to stick to X-Array. So now let's go ahead and import our modules. So import X-Array as XR. And let's go ahead and load in some data. So I'm going to give you a URL first. We're going to call netcdf file. And I'm going to suggest that you copy and paste this URL from the description or in the uh, notebook if, you're, if you've got that open. So there we are. And I'm going to go in ahead and create a new object called xrds equals xr.openDataset. And that's going to be netcdf file. If I run this, and actually I'm also going to print XRDS so you can have a look at what's output. I'm gonna open the output terminal and run that again. And there you go. You can see my NetCDF file has been opened up. Now, you might be wondering what just happened. You don't have the NetCDF file downloaded to your computer, but you've been able to load the data into Python. This is possible because the data are available via what is called OpenDAP. So this is the OpenDAP webpage at OpenDAP.org. OpenDAP stands for Open Source Project 
for a network data access protocol. And put simply, it basically makes it easier to access and share published scientific data over the internet. I'm not going to go into any more detail than that now. But if you are interested, please let me know in the comments and maybe I'll make another video about OpenDAP. For now, we're just going to use the beauty of OpenDAP without necessarily uh, understanding exactly how it works. So let's have a look at this X-ray object that we've just printed. You can see that a NetCDF file is broken down into three or four different uh, sections, depending on how you look at it. Firstly, you have dimensions. And in this case, we only have one dimension, pressure, or I assume it's pressure for press. And this has a value of 320. We then have our coordinate variables. In this case, we only have one coordinate variable, press. And this coordinate variable has the dimension of pressure. And then below this, as well as our coordinate variables, we also have data variables. So we can see there's actually 33 data variables here, but we're only displaying 12 of them. And every single one of them has a dimension of press pressure. Now this tells us straight away that all of our data variables are one dimensional arrays with 320 points. We can also see here the type of data which is stored in each variable. So we have float 32 in this case, which tells us that these are decimal numbers. And at the bottom, you can see the attributes. And these are what we call global attributes. We're displaying 12 in this case, but there are 73 in this file. And global attributes are metadata that describe the file as a whole. Each variable also has its own attributes, variable attributes, but we can't see them within this display. We'll get into how to access those shortly. So let's go back to the code. I'm going to get rid of this print for now. So let's go ahead now and access each of those different components in turn, starting at the bottom with the attributes. So we can do that by typing in XRDS, the name of our X-ray object, dot attrus. And before I save that as something, I'm going to just uh, print it so we can see it again in below. And I'm going to run that. And what we can see is that all our attributes have been printed here in a Python dictionary. You can see that here with these um, funny curly brackets. Now that output is not particularly nice to look at. So if you want to have a uh, display that's a bit easier, you could do something like for um, attribute value in xrds.atras.items and then print attribute value. And then we're also gonna make sure we have a line break in between them. If I run that now, we can open this up and we can now see each of the different attributes on a new line. We can also access an individual attribute by doing xrds.atras and then the key or the name of the attribute that you want to access. So perhaps one of the most important attributes in a NetCDF file is the conventions. And I'm going to print that so we can see the value in the terminal. If I hit run, we can see that in this case, this NetCDF file should be compliant with the CF conventions, version 1.8, the attribute conventions for data discovery, version 1.3, and the Ocean Sites manual, version 1.4. And this information is really useful because it tells you that the data creator should have been looking at these uh, conventions and making sure that this NetCDF file is compliant with them. And these conventions also show you as a data user, but also a machine, how to read and understand all of the contents of this NetCDF file. So this is a homepage of the attribute conventions for data discovery. And as the name suggests, uh, these are conventions for discovery metadata. 
which helps someone uh, find or discover a file. So in the contents of a NetCDF file, the attribute conventions for data discovery uh, state which global attributes you should be including in your NetCDF file. There's a list of highly recommended, recommended, and also um, suggested attributes. So if you see any of these terms within your NetCDF file, you can come here and uh, read what is meant by that to make sure that you have the same understanding of what this attribute is as the data creator had when they filled it in. The other conventions I'd like to quickly introduce you to are the CF conventions or the climate and forecast conventions. At the time of recording, we're up to version 1.11. So we can have a look at this in HTML. And this is a very long document. You, of course, don't have to read all of it. But you can think of this as a one-shop place to go if you want to know how to structure anything inside an NetCDF file. So, for example, if you have some um, depth profile like we have here, then this section here tells you about how you should be structuring the data and also which variable attributes you should be including. So, as these conventions have been referred to in the file, you can expect that the person who has created that file should have familiarized themselves with these conventions and the data should be compliant with them. And ideally, they should have also run their NetCDF file through a checker which should tell them if their NetCDF file is actually compliant with the CF conventions. Again, there'll be a link to these conventions down in the description, and I'll be referring to these conventions on and off throughout the course. The next thing you might want to look at is which dimensions your file has. So you might write uh, dimensions equals xrds.dims, and then we're going to print that variable dimensions so we can have a look at it. And we can see this here, pressure with a value of 320. Then again, this is a dictionary. So if you want to access an individual uh, dimension, you can do this. Give the name of dimension and let's rerun that here. And we returned with a value of 320, which is the size of that dimension. Continuing now, if we want to access the coordinate variables, we can do that. So I'm going to call that coords equals xrds dot coords and we can print that here and have a look and we can see in this case we have a single coordinate variable called press and we can see some of the values here to access our data variables we can do xrds dot data vars and then print data pars. And here we have the full list of all, uh, was it 32 or something variables that we have in this file. If we want to access an individual um, data variable, we can do that as well. So I'm going to get rid of this print for now. And let's say we want the temperature data we can do temperature equals xrds dot data vars and the name is temp in this case and we'll print that below and what you see and you might be surprised here but you don't actually see the values for the temperature uh, data what you see instead is the coordinate that corresponds to that data so you might remember that the um, the temperature has a dimension of pressure, which you can see here, and therefore it's also returned the coordinate variable uh, for pressure. And we can see all the variable attributes for this variable. So we can see that the values will be in degrees Celsius. They should be between uh, this temperature range. We can see that there's an ancillary variable, which means that there is a variable in the file called temp QC, which is related to this uh, variable. The coverage content type is physical measurements. This is opposed to, for example, uh, model results or something like that. And you have two different names. You have the long name, which is actually just a uh, free text name for um, whatever the data creator has decided to use to describe this variable. 
and we have a standard name. And this is a standardized name for the variable. So anyone who has seawater temperature data should be using a standard name of seawater temperature. There's a full list of CF standard names that you can choose from here. This is searchable. So if we have seawater temperature, um, I've not included the underscores here because I don't need to. There's a lot of different names you can look for. Find which one is a suitable variable for you, or if you're looking for one in particular, then you can read what is meant by that variable. This might sound straightforward when it comes to uh, seawater temperature, but for some variables, it's less easy to understand them from the name themselves. And it also makes it possible for machines to understand exactly what is meant by that variable. You'll see here, there's also a canonical units column. And in this case, the canonical units is uh, Kelvin. But you'll remember that back in the NetCDF file, uh, the units are degrees C or degrees Celsius. That's fine as long as you're using units that are physically equivalent to the canonical units. So degrees Celsius is fine. Meters would be obviously wrong. So let's look now at how to access the actual values. And we can do that by just adding dot values to the end. And this exports the data into a NumPy array. In this case, because there's only one dimension, it's a one dimensional array. But if your um, variable has two dimensions, you can export the data into a 2D array and so on. Now let's say we want to just look at the uh, variable attributes. So we can call this uh, temp var attributes. And we can do uh, xrds.data vars temp again and then dot hatras and if i print that and hit run you can see we have a python dictionary of all the attributes and again if we were to for example look at just an individual one of those we can do standard name for example and run that again and we return just the value for the standard name variable attribute. So that's everything for part one. I hope you'll join me in part two where we'll be looking at how to plot some of the data. And just a polite reminder that if you do use some of these data in a publication of your own, you should cite them in the same way that you cite a paper in the list of references. You can also write a statement in the data availability statement if you need to. But this should be as well as citing the data set in the list of references, not instead of. And the recommended citation for the data used in this tutorial can be found in the description of this video.